Why is vision important? 80 to 87 percent of information we take in comes through the visual system. Thus, vision is the dominant sense. Vision is the ability to process the information the brain receives from the eyes and other sense organs into meaningful information. But the ability to see clear 2020 is what's called acuity. The top number is always 20. Why is it always 20? It's the test distance. That's the distance you're at. The bottom number is where you should be able to see it from, or where the average person can see it from. So 20, 40 would mean that you're at 20 feet, you should be able to see it from 40 feet. Okay. 2015, you're still at 20 feet. You're always going to be at 20 feet. The bottom number is where the average person should have to be to see it. 2020 is what's called or considered normal vision. A lot of people have better than 2020. Some people have 2010 if you do. I actually had a professor in school that she claimed she could see 2005. She never could prove it to anybody because nobody else could see it. <laughs> but a refraction can be just what you do with that big instrument that we have. A lot of people now use what they call an automatic refractor. You all heard that term where they set you in front of it and it does it for you. What's the problem with that? All it tests is the eyeballs. Right? There's nothing about it. The interaction of the brain with the eyes. Now you get into the analytical analysis and it tests all of those things. Binocular vision is much more important than acuity because you have you can see a lot of people that have 2020 even 2015 vision but they can't walk across the room. We have to remember that visual processing or binocular vision is a function of the brain, not of the eyeballs. Like I saw one yesterday, he was still using his hands to tell us where his name was. He could see 2020, but he was still reaching out and touching everything. Why was he doing that? He could not trust his vision to tell him where it was and what it was, even though he could see it clear. They wouldn't tell him where and what it was. Terrible time with school. Because things kept moving around. Vision develops. You're not born with the ability to see. Just like you're not born with the ability to walk. Vision is really a lot more complicated than being able to walk. So we develop that ability. It's learned and it's impacted by internal and external forces. So if it's impacted by them, that means forces can be brought to bear which enhance and or interfere with development of efficient binocular vision. Now here's an important one. Vision can be enhanced at any age. The old bugaboo used to say, you know, if they're over five years old and then it went up to nine years old, forget it. You can't do anything with them. But you can. The brain is not static. Because remember, we're not dealing with eyeballs here. We're dealing with the brain. The brain can make new connections. Look at this picture. If you've seen it before, be quiet. Don't tell, <laughs> don't tell everybody else what it is. Can you see it? What's wrong? You don't have acuity problems, do you? Once you see what this really is, you'll never see it any other way. Does that have anything to do with how clear you see it? It's technique. This is called the Renshaw cow. But you'll never look at that picture again without immediately seeing a cow. And this is what we're talking about when we talk about vision versus acuity. Uh, binocularity is the ability of the brain to persist process the input from both eyes into meaningful information or comprehension. Suppression is the mechanism by which the brain turns off 
information from one eye to eliminate double vision. If you weren't aware of it, as long as you're moving, you will not see double. Okay? You will not see double as long as you're in movement. But if you make them stop, they can't do it because they'd see double. And it's natural instinct to try to avoid seeing double. Because it's dangerous to see double. Don't you think it's dangerous to see double? I had a little girl in not long ago. She was about 11 years old. She had a black eye. She said, what happened? I said, what happened to you? We were playing dodgeball and I dodged the wrong ball. <laughs> As I like to see people that have had acquired brain injuries as soon as I can after it happens. Why? Because we know the brain goes through the process of trying to do something about the double vision. We want the brain to do what we want it to do. You know, if you have a broken leg, you don't let the doctor say, well, let's see how that thing heals, and if it heals the wrong way, we'll break it and send it. Okay, what do they do? They send it the first thing. Well, what we need to do in these cases, we don't need to be waiting a length of time to see what their brain does to get rid of the double vision. What we need to do is make sure the brain's doing the right thing. Vision therapy is the arranging of conditions for learning to use the vision system effectively, therefore developing efficient binocular vision skills. Anyone who alters visual input, whether by lenses, occlusion, or other methods, is performing vision therapy. My therapy program is generally eight weeks. And generally by the end of eight weeks, we've got probably 75% of patients where we're going. Here's the types of enhancers we talk about. We talk about lenses, which lenses can be comp compensatory, which that means they just compensate for the problem. That's what we do generally with uh, when we prescribe a prescription for nearsightedness, farsightedness, astigmatism, <coughs> even those, those are conditions that develop from stress on the system. Those are the way we correct those. Uh, in prism, you can have compensatory prism, which that's the most commonly used type of prism. That's where you have a, a person where they see double, you put prism on there to make them see singly. The only problem with that is it doesn't work a long time. You know, they'll see single for a little while, and then they'll call what we call eat up the prism. They'll, it'll be like the people that are near side do the same thing again. So that is not very effective. Uh, Yoke is what I call therapeutic prism. It works differently. The thing that's different about it is yoke prism sends information to the brain through a different route than compensatory lenses do. What does prism do? It moves where light is. So technically, yoked prism makes things look a little bit different place. We use just small amounts of this in the prescription. 
We use three base substance. Nobody can even tell it's in the lens as far as people looking at them. So that's just the mind of these. Uh, but they have to wear those all the time. And that in itself is a therapy. We found out years ago if you had patients sit down at a desk and learn to do something, as long as they're sitting there, they might be able to do it. But you get them up and walking around, and they couldn't do it anymore. But if you can get them doing it in those situations, they can do it anyway. But it's not the walking rails and the balance boards that are making the difference. It's the lenses that are making the difference. Okay. Yoke's prison, it's like I said, we open, try to open that back up. Now, a lot of cases, and I'd actually say in most cases, if you can get that open back up, get it functioning, eventually you can do that to your prison, you'll be fine. In fact, using your prison, I tell my patients, particularly the developmental patients, if you use low yolk prism, it's like if you've got a broken leg and you need a crutch. You know, if your leg's broke, it's a whole lot easier to get around with a crutch for a while. But what happens after the leg? Do you still want to use a crutch? No, it's in the way. And yolk prism works the same way. If you need it, it helps tremendously. But it can come to the point to where it's more in the way than it helps. And if that becomes the case, then you discontinue. Now, we see this a lot in little kids. They'll get their lenses, and you can't get them to take them off for a while, for a period of several weeks. You know, they feel like they do so much better. And then, all of a sudden, they'll say, well, I can see better without these than with them. And it's true, they do. That's when they're functioning the way they need to. And that's when you don't need to use them any longer. Those of us that wear glasses, don't hear as well without our glasses on. <laughs> true fact. It's true. And then you wonder why these kids that have difficulty, and even adults that have difficulty, measure auditory problems. Vision is dominant. And a lot of times, unless you get the vision straightened out, doing some of the other therapies, sort of like pouring water on the duck's back. You know, it just doesn't really have the effect it should have. In fact, I had a patient not too long ago that his mother was a speech pathologist. She said, I put him in yolk prism and we'd done a little bit of therapy on him. And, I, and she said, you know, it made more difference in him in two months than I'd been able to make in three years with my speech therapy. And like I had a patient uh, this last week that she brought her son in. And, uh, she said, we've been going to the Sylvan for three years. So he was still getting all this. We brought him here for his videos visual evaluation. He's had his eight weeks of therapy. His last report card still getting all left. He's got three A's and two C's. And we quit Sylvan three weeks ago because we hadn't seen any progress at all. But it's treating the problem differently. Okay? And I think it's really getting to the root of the problem rather than... Because we don't teach reading. Okay? I never tell a patient we teach reading because we don't. And any of you that have seen my therapy program know that we don't do anything for you. Absolutely nothing. But then I had a therapist seen this last week from over Blunt Memorial that she was telling me her daughter had had vision therapy a couple of years ago. And she said right before the therapy, the teacher had tested her reading level and said, oh, she's bad. So we did six weeks of the therapy and the girl started complaining. I need something harder to do in reading. So the teacher said, well, we'll test you again. That six weeks, she'd gone up over a year in reading. But we hadn't done anything with her. You know, that's not, we're just getting the skills ready for them to be able to handle it. But she was there, there at our office on Monday. And by Tuesday, she called back and she was at two more ophthalmologists' office that. And basically what they do is they tell them, 
there's nothing wrong with the eyes. Which we already know there's nothing wrong with the eyes. I've already told them there's nothing wrong with the eyes. And what I tell my patient is you got two perfectly good eyes that don't work together. But that's not a problem with the eyeballs. That's a problem with the processing. And they thought the eye movements were the problem. And if you got the eye movements straightened out, then they were fine, that the processing would be okay. Come to find out that's not true. It's the processing that's the problem. And it causes, in turn, the eye movements to be a problem. Does anybody know what an amblyopia is? Lazy eye. What's a lazy eye? No, it's not. It's not an eye that wants. Technically, a lazy eye is an eye that sees two lines less clearly than the other eye. That's all there is to it. has nothing to do with that. This, on the other hand, is propious. These are what people think are lazy eyes, but they're not. The first one, the top one, how's that eye turn? In. It's called an esotrope. The bottom one, Turns out, it's called an exotrope. Those are tropius, they're not lazy eyes. Because they can see 20, some of them can see 20, 20 with each one of them. So they have equal acuity. So they're not lazy. They just can't <coughs> use them both at the same time. Now, I am one of those people that does not patch like that. Why would you not patch like that? Huh? That's right. That's exactly why you do it. Because if you patch it, you're, patch, you're treating it like it's a problem with just one eye. It's not a problem with one eye. It's a problem in using the two eyes together. Okay? So what happens if you patch them? You make them even better at using just one eye. They may swap between them better, and they may be more equal, but they still won't work together. I have one of the employees here in the office, her daughter is an RN that lives in Atlanta. And she'd been dealing with dizziness for months and got to the point where she was afraid to go out driving because she was so dizzy and she'd been through the, the vestibular centers and all that down there and still no help. So Barbara finally talked her into coming up here. We did an exam. All we did was put the old prison on her. She's the first contact. We just put three base up on her. Within a week, no more dizziness. She was back in this week. She was still wearing the yoke prison. She said, I'm almost afraid to take it off because I'm afraid I'll go back to like I was. <laughs>